Bismillah, alhamdulillah. Bismillah, alhamdulillah. Salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Alhamdulillah. Hamdan yuwafi ni'amahu wa yukafi'u mazidah. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma alimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima alamtana. Wa zidna ilman ya kareem. Rabbi sharah li sadri wa yisir li amri wa hlul uqadatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. Rabbi zidni ilman, Rabbi zidni ilman, Rabbi zidni ilma. Allahumma la sahla illa ma ja'altahu sahla wa anta taj'alul hazna idha shi'ita sahla. Welcome everyone, we're restarting or continuing the tafsir al-juz amma. And today we are looking at Surah At-Takweer. Surah At-Takweer is a Makki Surah, i.e. it was revealed before the migration of the Prophet ﷺ to Medina by the consensus of the Islamic scholars. There's no uh, difference of opinion about this. And as I said earlier in one of the previous lessons, most of the Surah of Juz Amma happen to be Makki Surahs, just the context of them the sizes of the verses, because normally Makki surahs are shorter in terms of their, in terms of their ayat. Because you're, Allah is addressing people who are non-Muslims, so to captivate them, Allah gives them small verses that they can quickly catch on to. But when it comes to Medina and the Madani surahs, usually they're very long in terms of their ayat. And they're long in terms of the actual surah as well, because they are addressed to Muslims after Islam had flourished in Medina. So the address happens largely to be, not entirely so, but largely to be to Muslims. So naturally, the verses can be longer because they're ready to listen. And that also tells you of how to speak to people as well. As they say, لِكُلِّ مَقَامٍ مقال. In every situation, there's something to say. So when you are speaking to people who are ready to listen to you, they've given, your und- they've given you your undivided attention, there's a way to speak. But then when you're speaking to people who haven't given you that undivided attention and you're just trying to captivate them, then there's another way to speak as well. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us that by example in the way Allah reveals the Makki surahs versus the Madani surahs. Even the context, the topics, all of those things. The way Allah starts the surah as well. Even from the very start, sometimes you can tell, okay, this must be a Makki because it's starting in, in a specific way, a specific tone. And that becomes known to a person as they read more and more of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts the surah and he says, إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوِّرَتْ Now, there are three surahs that start with the إِذَا in Juz Amma. And unlike a lot of the virtues of the different surah or the hadith related to the different surah, right? There is an actual authentic hadith about this particular surah, along with its two sisters as well, i.e. the Sama'un Fatarat and the Sama'un Shaqqat as well. So there's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in which he said, whoever wishes to, man sarrahu, whoever wishes to see the day of judgment, ra'iya al-ayn, as if he's looking at it directly, then let him read these three surahs. The first of them is إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوِّرَتْ Then إِذَا السَّمَاءُ فَطَرَتْ And then after that إِذَا السَّمَاءُ شَقَّتْ Whoever wishes to see the day of judgment as if he's looking at it, then let him read these three surahs and he mentioned them by name. He said إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوِّرَتْ إِذَا السَّمَاءُ فَطَرَتْ And إِذَا السَّمَاءُ شَقَّتْ So these three surahs, they are describing the day of judgment and how the day of judgment will happen. And the first of the three obviously is إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوِّرَتْ and this hadith is greeted jayyid by Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani in Fath al-Bari. He says, Allah says, إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوِّرَاتْ When the sun, when the sun is kuwirat, when it's wrapped up, taqweer, to wrap something up. And from that comes also the word taqweer uh, al-imama, when you wrap up the turban around the head, what happens? You wrap that turban around the head, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He uh, tells us in the Qur'an about the day and the night as well. يُكَوِّرُ اللَّيْلَ عَلَى النَّهَارِ وَيُكَوِّرُ النَّهَارِ عَلَى اللَّيْلِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does taqweer of the day into the night, the day, and the night into the day as well. And from that, by the way, Allah doing the taqweer of the night into the day and the night and the day into the night, i.e. wrapping the, the night into the day and the day into the night, 
some of the scholars, they said from this you can take a hint that Allah is telling us in the Qur'an of the fact that the earth is not a flat plane, as it was a common belief during that time. In fact, there's other uh, reasons to believe that as well, right? وَالْأَرْضَ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ دَحَاهَا After that, Allah Azza wa Jal ended up doing a dahi to the earth. And uh, the Arabs, they used, to word, they used the word dahiya, and they would refer to eggs. And that's a dialect till today that's used by certain uh, countries. So for example, in old uh, elderly Egyptians, if you go ask them what that word means, they'll say it means an egg. Okay, Even though it's not very commonly used today, maybe in some places it still is. But that's, that's an egg, and, and the reality is the earth actually looks like an egg. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala referred to it in this way. So, إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوِّرَتْ When the sun is wrapped up. Why? Because it's time for the sun to be put away, you know? You have lighting on for quite some time, and then when you want to wrap the scene up, what do you do? You wrap up the lighting, right? Similarly, the scene of this world is going to be finishing on the Day of Judgment, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wraps up that lighting. إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوِّرَاتِ وَإِذَا النُّجُومُ كَدَرَاتِ Now, the stars, they take their light from the sun. <coughs> and spe- specifically the moon. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, after the sun has been wrapped up, then it's only natural that the stars have got to go as well. وَإِذَا النُّجُومُ كَدَرَاتِ When the, s- the stars, they will begin to lose the luster and the glitter that you see of these stars. This is the day of judgment Allah is describing. وَإِذَا الْجِبَالُ سُيِّرَاتِ And there's also mountains Allah talks about. These mountains, what happens to them? سُيِّرَاتِ Essentially, Allah Azza wa Jal will take these mountains and crush them. Allah says, وَبُسَّتِ الْجِبَالُ بَسَّا And the mountains are completely crushed. فَكَانَتْ هَبَاءً مُنْبَثَّا And then they end up becoming haba. They end up becoming Dust that is spread all over the place. It's uh, going in every single direction. It's mumbath. It is dust that is flying around every, everywhere. Okay? وَإِذَا الْجِبَالُ سُيِّرَاتِ So the jibal are suyirat. They're moved away from their places and they're moving around within the world. Now there's something very important here. Firstly, what happens? وَبُسَّتِ الْجِبَالُ بَسَّ The mountains... They are crushed into small pieces and then they become dust. Now, the mountains as they're flying around, are they actual mountains at this point? They're dust clouds. And that's why Allah says, وَتَرَ الْجِبَالَ تَحْسَبُهَا جَامِدَةً وَهِيَ تَمُرُّ مَرَّ السَّحَابِ You will see at that moment mountains, you will think, you will imagine that these actually are Raw, thick, uh, very strong mountains, but they're not strong mountains at that moment. They are, they are flowing like the clouds flow, because they become like dust clouds. These mountains, because the mountains are first crushed by Allah, then all of the dust of these mountains it starts to fly because there's no gravitational force pulling it down. Remember, gravity is gone on the day of judgment. Everything is going haywire, right? And then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Wa idha al-ishar wa'utilat," and also the ishar. The she-camels, the she-camels, they are completely neglected as well. And not just any she-camels, they say Ishar is a camel that's about to give birth. Okay? It's a she-camel that's very close to the birth point. Now, normally the Arabs, they were very cognizant about looking after the she-camel. And even today, when you have livestock and you have an animal that's about to give birth, you look after it because it ends up multiplying your wealth, right? So at this moment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the ishar, the full term she camels, they go untended, nobody's looking after them anymore. All of these serious things taking place. Now, if you think about it, this kind of seems out of place as well. Why? Because Allah is talking about the sun, Allah is talking about the stars, Allah is talking about the mountains, and then suddenly a she camel, right? In order to understand this, you have to understand what the she-camel represents when it's full term, what it represents to the early Arabs is the, the premier wealth, okay? This is the most prized possessions that they had. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using that and capitalizing that and using their culture as well. 
And it's not referring to only the she-camels. Allah is saying people with all of the wealth that they have, they will begin to neglect it at that moment. Someone who has a bank balance of hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, you're going to be very, <coughs> you see them in this world, they're very, very careful with their wallet. They're very, very careful with their cell phones that has their cards all uh, programmed into it, right? They're very careful with all these things. But on the day of judgment, وَإِذَا الْعِشَارُ عُطِّلَتْ On the day of judgment, they will not be looking after these phones and their wallets. And they're not going to be looking after their millions. And they're not, Jazakallah Khair Shaykh. They will not be looking after any of this. They won't be looking after any of this. عُطِّلَتْ The best of your wealth is left untended. The car, if you drove a Porsche, left untended. The car, if you drove something better or worse, Left untended. You're not going to be looking after it. وَإِذَا الْوُحُوشُ حُشِرَتْ And then Allah says, then there will also be الْوُحُوشُ They will be resurrected as well. Now, these early verses of the surah, some of the scholars, they said that these are actually not occurrences of the Day of Judgment. Okay? So the sun becoming wrapped up, it's not the Day of Judgment yet. The stars becoming dull and losing their glitter and glamour, it's not the day of judgment. And the mountains being crushed and them flying around and being moved away from their positions is not the day of judgment yet. And people leaving all of their things and belongings untended is not the day of judgment yet. But then when Allah says, وَإِذَا الْوُحُوشُ حُشِرَتْ Now the day of judgment begins. Okay? So they said that these early verses are all Signs of the Day of Judgment That the Day of Judgment is about to start So be careful There are some of the final signs of the Day of Judgment And then the Day of Judgment begins When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Starts the resurrection process When all of the animals will begin to be resurrected as well And that's because the resurrection will not only be for human beings It will also be for jinns And it will also be for animals as well The animals, they're not going to be in hellfire or jannah they will be resurrected and there will be a hisab or there will be a qisas rather. There will be a judgment between the animals. If an animal <coughs> had harmed another animal, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will judge between these animals. But will they go to Jannah or not? No. Will they go to hellfire and, jann- and paradise? The answer is no. They will after the qisas between the animals takes place, after the justice is served between the animals, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to the animals, become dirt, and they will become dirt, and that's the end of the animals. But they will be resurrected by the merit of this verse. When all of the animals and all of the beasts are resurrected as well. And also, there, there, there's, let's not forget the seas. Because there is no gravity holding anything down at this point, right? Before, because of gravity, water, if you take this water and open it up and start pouring, it's going to fall. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the, the water of the seas will begin to overflow. And there he says, وَإِذَا الْبِحَارُ fujirat, They will be blown like an explosion into the water. And what that means is also, because there's no gravity holding anything down anymore, so things go haywire, the stars don't stay in their places anymore, the... The water begins to overflow on top of the land as well. وَإِذَا الْبِحَارُ سُجِّرَتْ Some of the ulama, they said that i.e. all of the water bodies will become like one body. Because now the water is not going to be pulled right to the, uh, the, the bottom of the, of the plates of the earth, but rather it will begin to overflow so all of the earth will become filled, filled with water. وَإِذَا النُّفُوسُ زُوِّجَاتْ And now, because we're on the Day of Judgment at this point, right? Okay, people will be gathered together with their pairs. What does that mean? That means if you're married to someone, you're going to be gathered together on the day of judgment for a vacation? No. What that means is that people will be gathered together on the day of judgment <coughs> based on the groups, their appropriate groups. Each person and his own group. Okay? So there's going to be people. And Allah t- tells us of this in Surah Al-Waqi'ah as well. What does He say? Allah says that وَكُنْتُمْ أَزْوَاجًا ثَلَاثًا And all of you will become three groups on the Day of Judgment. فَأَصْحَابُ الْمَيْمَنَةِ مَا أَصْحَابُ الْمَيْمَنَةِ 
There will be a group of people that will be the people of the right hand, i.e. people who will be given their book in the right hand, and they will be those people who are the people of the right. وَأَصْحَابُ الْمَشْأَمَةِ مَا أَصْحَابُ الْمَشْأَمَةِ And also there will be a people of the left hand, and they will be given their book in the left hand, وَالسَّابِقُونَ السَّابِقُونَ And then there's going to be people who are السَّابِقُونَ They were racing to do good things. So people will be divided into three groups on the Day of Judgment. <coughs> and each person will be placed with their own group. Those people who are racing to do good, they will be placed مع الصديقين والشهداء والصالحين. مع النبيين والصديقين والشهداء والصالحين. And then there will be those people who are not racing to do good, but they were pretty good people. They'll be placed in, in the company of the pretty good people as well. And then there's going to be a third group of people who are not so good and they'll be placed in that group. So Allah says, وَإِذَا النُّفُوسُ زُوِّجَتْ And this is very similar to when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أُحْشُرُ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا وَأَزْوَاجَهُمْ Resurrect those people who have transgressed against themselves and against other people as well, and their peers as well. It doesn't mean azwaj, meaning their wives or their spouses or husbands, etc. No, it means people who were like them. Those people who are dhalama, those people who are transgressors within this world, they will be paired on the Day of Judgment with those who transgressed. Those people who are righteous, they will be paired with the people who are righteous. Those people who are the followers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa they will be paired with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. يَوْمَ نَدْعُوا كُلَّ أُنَاسٍ بِإِمَامِهِمْ On that day we'll call every single group of people with their leader. So people will be paired up with their own kind. وَإِذَا النُّفُوسُ زُوِّجَتْ وَإِذَا الْمَوْؤُودَةُ سُئِلَتْ All of these things are now the day of judgment. Okay? And of course in the middle of it I told you some of the first verses there's a disagreement about. Whether they're the day of judgment or the final signs of the day of judgment. But a lot of scholars also believe all of it is the Day of Judgment. وَإِذَا الْمَوْؤُودَةُ سُئِلَتْ Now there's a child, a female girl, an infant that is buried alive because the pre-Islamic Arabians, they had a very sick practice. They had a very despicable practice. They, had a, they used to commit a heinous crime against infants that were born female. And they would take this female child and they would bury the child alive. And this was actually done by some of the Sahaba to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam before they accepted Islam as well. And they were very sad at the fact that they had done this. Like Umar ibn Khattab himself. They would take the child and they would bury this child alive if the child is born a female. Why? Because they would be afraid. What if we go into war and battle and this particular uh, girl is picked up as a war captive and then she's raped. So instead of waiting for that, they would bury the child. This is serious misguidance. They're worried about a possible rape, so they end up burying the child. Also, they would be concerned that she would become final financial baggage. Because if you have a female child, and you're in those societies, there's no way you're going to get any earnings out of her. She's going to be feeding from you for the rest of your life, unless <coughs> she gets married. So they would bury these particular child, children, however some of them, the people of no nobility, they wouldn't do this. And there was a Sahabi, his name was Sa'sa'ah. Sa'sa'ah bin Najiyah ibn Aqil. And the Sahabi, he has a very interesting story. He came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he accepted Islam. And then after he accepted Islam, he said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, O Prophet of Allah, will I be rewarded for the deeds that I'd done before I had accepted Islam. And the Prophet ﷺ said, What had you done, O Sa'a, that you asked this question? So Sa'a, he said that one day I had two she camels. They were both Ishar. Literally, the hadith says, Ashrawan. They were both Ishar, meaning they were uh, childbearing. Okay? So they were about to give birth. And he said, I had two she camels that were in the desert and they started to wander off and, and I lost them. So I started searching and searching and searching and I said, today if I find these camels, I'm going to do anything to fulfill the need of a person that I see who happens to be needy. So he goes in search for these she camels and then he sees from afar a light. And then he says, I'm going to continue to follow this light until I get to it. Because the light 
in, in the desert at night time, what does it mean? That means there's a fire there, there's a potential that the she-camels wandered off to after the fire as well, right? Because they see some light in a certain direction, so they start following it as well. So he goes and follows the light, and he gets there, and over there, there's a man, he's sitting there, and he welcomes this man, and he says, what's your name? He says, my name is Sa'asaha, Ibn Najiya bin Aqi. And Sa'asaha is welcomed by this man, he said, marhaban bi sayyidina wa bni sayyidina. Welcome to our master and the child of our master as well. So Sa'asaha is a person of nobility in pre-Islamic times. And he's also a person of wealth as well. So he goes up to this man and he sits down. And as they're sitting, suddenly, there's some women in the background, they start saying, Qadja, Qadja, he's, he's come, he's come, it's come. So he says, what's come? So this man, whose tent Sa'a had arrived at, he said that, I have some women over there, they're giving birth, and they're saying the child has come. And then he says to the woman, he says that if it is a male child, then I don't know what to do with it. But if it happens to be a female child, then break its neck and bury it into the ground. Break her neck and bury it into the ground. Bury her into the ground. So Sa'asa, he says, what do you mean bury her into the ground? All of this is before Islam, by the way. So he says, I will buy your child off of you. And he says, you want to take my free child and buy her? Because now he doesn't want to sell a child who is his own in lineage and that child ends up becoming a slave girl. And he's more happier of killing this girl than making her a slave for someone else. So he says, no, 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 no. I'm not trying to make her a slave girl of mine. I just want to buy her life from you. For heaven's sake, just give me this child. I'll pay whatever I can for this child. He said, okay. He said, you know those two she-camels that, that are right over here that you'd lost? He said, I want both of them. The impregnated she-camels. So I get the she-camels and I get whatever they're bearing as well. Whatever they have within their tummies. And he says, both of them are yours. He says, but wait. You see that meal camel that you're on, that you came here with? He said, yeah. He said, I want that male camel as well. Give me that male camel. So he takes the two she camels and they're both impregnated. And he takes the, the children as well. And he takes also a third camel. So how many are we left with? Five camels. And sometimes camels are very expensive. Five to 15 to 20 to 30, sometimes into the millions as well. So you're talking about a very valuable possession. He says, okay, take them all. But I want to make sure that this child is freed and that it's not killed. This is a person of honor, even within the pre-Islamic time. So he takes this child and he gives all of the camels, but he says, give me one condition that I have to make with you. I don't have a ride home, so let me take the camel that I came with, but send someone with me. As soon as I get back home, he can take the camel back with, with him and come back to you. He said, okay, you have that. So he goes back home and he takes this little girl and he saves the life of this girl. And he says to the Prophet O oh Prophet of Allah, will I be rewarded for this action? And then he said that I had, as Imam al-Dhahabi mentioned in Seer Alam al-Nubala, he said, I had freed 300 camels like this. 300 girls like this. I had freed 300 girls like this in my life. Some of the reports have it, 100. Some of them, they say 70. At any cost, 70 women, this man single-handedly freed because he was a person of honor and he didn't want people to die for no reason. He didn't want this to happen. That وَإِذَا الْمَوْؤُودَةُ سُئِلَتْ That infant that is buried without any cause, without any justification, she's asked, سُئِلَتْ بِأَيِّ ذَنْبٍ قُتِلَتْ Why were you killed? And this is the great-great-grandfather of the famous poet Al-Farazdaq. Al-Farazdaq is actually the grandson of Sa'a ibn uh, Najia ibn Aqil, and he is the one who, about whom Al Farazdaq says, الْوَائِدَاتِ My grandfather was the one who used to block the wa'idat. He was the one who would stop the women from burying their female children alive. He was that one. وَجَدِّ الَّذِي مَنَعَ الْوَائِدَاتِ And he was the one who protected the wa'id. 
He was the one who protected the child from being buried alive and the child would then not be buried alive. This is Al-Farazdaq's grandfather. So there were people of honor and nobility and the Prophet ﷺ said, you will be rewarded for those actions now that you've accepted Islam. وَإِذَا الْمَوْؤُودَةُ سُئِلَتْ When the mawuda will be asked on the Day of Judgment, in another qira'a, وَإِذَا الْمَوْؤُودَةُ سَأَلَتْ When on the Day of Judgment, when the mawuda, the infant buried child will be asked, and will ask on the Day of Judgment, Why was I killed? بِأَيِّ ذَنْبٍ قُتِلَتْ Why was I killed? وَإِذَا الصُّحُفُ نُشِرَتْ Now, why is the Ma'uda being asked based on the famous Qira'ah? Why is the Ma'uda being asked? Why is this infant child who was buried herself being asked? Because when these people are burying their children, Allah doesn't even deem them enough to be addressed by the address of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah addresses the child and He says, do you, you, do you know why you were killed? Why were you buried? And she'll say, I, I don't know the reason. And then obviously the proof of Allah Azza wa Jal against His people, it becomes even more manifest. That you had no reason, the child didn't know the reason. It's not like she went through a trial, that you put her through a trial, and then you ended up killing her. وَإِذَا الْمَوْؤُودَةُ سُئِلَتْ أَوْ سَأَلَتْ بِأَيِّ ذَنْبٍ قُتِلَتْ وَإِذَا الصُّحُفُ نُشِرَتْ And now the Day of Judgment is here. So the suhuf are also nushirat. All of, all of the pages upon which the angels of Allah Azza wa Jal used to write. Because there's angels of Allah. مَا يَلْفِضُ مِنْ قَوْلٍ إِلَّا لَدَيْهِ رَقِيبٌ عَتِيدٌ There's a raqib that is also atid. Kiraman katibin. They happen to be angels which were very honorable. And they also write as well. And they are raqib and they are atid as well. These angels are five angels as Imam Al-Qurtubi mentions. Angels... Two of them who remain with the person through half of the day. And then another two, they have another shift. So they have shifts that they go by. And then during the next portion of the day, the other two come and these two leave. And then there's one angel that is there at all times. At all times. So these are kiram and katibin, Allah calls them. They're honorable angels. And they end up writing every single thing that a person says every single thing that a person does, when a person walks, when a person talks. Some of the Salaf, they used to believe otherwise, but the correct opinion, Wallahu A'lam, is that they write every single thing because Allah says, مَا يَلْفِضُ مِنْ قَوْلٍ مَا لِهَذَا الْكِتَابِ لَا يُغَادِرُ صَغِيرَةً وَلَا كَبِيرًا That what's wrong with this book? It doesn't let go of something small, nor of something big. And that's why Imam Ahmed, Ibn Hanbal, on, the, on his deathbed, he was crying. And as Imam Ahmed is crying, and he was feeling pain, and you could hear the noise from Imam Ahmed as he's on his deathbed. And Sufyan, he came to him, and he said that, Oh Ahmed, did you not know that the angels, they end up writing everything, even the noise that a person going through pain makes. So Imam Ahmed stopped making that noise at that point. So that means they believe that they write down every single thing, not just the righteous and the evil deeds, but everything. So they write down everything. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, all of that will be presented. وَإِذَا الصُّحُفُ نُشِرَتْ Everything is presented, everything is reflected, everything is placed on these, on these pages that the angels write. وَإِذَا السَّمَاءُ كُشِطَتْ And also, when the sky is completely stripped off and there is no more canopy that you see before you, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used to boast about, that... That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised this canopy بِغَيْرِ عَمَدٍ تَرَوْنَهَا All of it is without a pillar that you can notice. What's that pillar? They say it's gravity perhaps. But as I said, on the Day of Judgment, when the system starts to flop, there is no gravity. There is nothing to hold up the canopy. There is nothing to hold down the water. There is nothing to hold down the mountains as well. Everything is haywire. وَإِذَا الْجَحِيمُ سُعْرَتْ And now when the Day of Judgment starts, <coughs> now the fire is even further ignited. Remember, the fire is already there, it's being kindled, it's been around for time immemorial. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when the day of judgment comes, then it's notched up. You see when sometimes people are baking at the last moment, they notch it up a little bit to make it extra hotter when it's coming out, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment, the oven of Jahannam is going, 
But Allah notches it up. Su'irat. It's further blazed. وَإِذَا الْجَنَّةُ أُزْلِفَتْ And the Jannah, the paradise, is brought closer to the people who happen to be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The people who are far away from Allah azza wa jal, the Jannah is distanced from those people. To a point that they're not even going to smell the scent of Jannah. And those people who are close to Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah will bring the Jannah close to them. Just like the hair of their body happens to be close to them. Alimat nafsum ma ahdarat. And Umar ibn Khattab and Ibn Abbas, as they used to read these ayat, they would say, This is the reason why Allah was saying everything before it. This was the ayah for which Allah was saying all of these things about the day of judgment. Ayah number 14 is the reason why Allah is describing everything over here. Allah is describing the sun as it's wrapped away, the stars as they lose their luster and their glitter, as they lose their lust and glitter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing the mountains as they begin to flow and move. Allah is describing the wealth of the people as it's neglected. Allah is describing the animals and beasts when they're resurrected, the, the water, the sea, the oceans as they begin to overflow and combine. Allah is talking about the souls and the, and the beings as they're connected with one another. The mawuda as it's questioned, why were you buried alive? The suhuf, the pages of every single person's book as it's also placed before people. The sky and the canopy as it loses its system as well. As it's stripped off and ripped off of where it used to be. And Allah is describing the fire and the jannah as well. All of that is being done, why? Alimat nafsum ma ahdurat. Because now the soul knows every single thing that it had presented. Now the soul knows what it brought forth. Now the good people know because the suhuf are right there, manshuratun amamahu. All of the pages that were written by the angels, they happen to be sitting right before them. This is what you've done. These are the results of your exams. So now every single soul knows, alimat nafsum ma ahdarat. Every soul knows what it had brought forth for the day of judgment. Because this suhuf are right over there. Iqra kitabak, read your book. You yourself will be able to judge your own self today. Every soul will know. It's like when you go for an exam and you do your studies and you do your due diligence, at the end of it, you will know what you've done approximately. But when the exam results come, now at that point you know exactly what you did, how deep you are in the, uh, in, in the minuses or how high you are in the pluses, right? You know that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, now every single soul is going to know what they had brought forth for the day of judgment. فَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِالْخُنَّسِ Al Khanisa is a deer, or it is a cow. And the Arabs they refer to this Khanisa, this cow or this deer, when it is moving away. Okay? You see, when the deer starts to move back and run away from you, that is Al Khanisa. It's trying to hide away from you. And similarly, Al Jariya is also a deer. All of these are descriptions of deers. Okay? You've got to listen very carefully to get this. Al Khanisa, Al Kanisa, and Al Jariya, all of them happen to be deers. And they're different descriptions of deers. So, as a deer or a cow is running away from you or moving away from you, it's called a Khanisa. And then when it runs, it's called a Jariya. And last but not least, 